Now we would like to begin session one. Carbon neutral housing and building. I'm the coordinator for this forum and I will be serving as the moderator for each session. My name is Toru Kurahashi. So from Cambridge University, I would like to, uh, from Department of Land uh, Economy, I would like to invite Professor Franz first. He will be talking about green building and market pricing, the UK perspective. So um, Professor first, please uh, turn your microphone on and, tr and uh, present to the Jap English channel. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Professor Karahashi, um, President uh, of Tokyo University. It is a great honor and pleasure to be able to present today, if not um, in person, uh, then uh, virtually. And uh, I was very impressed to hear about the, the, the long history of uh, not just your university, but also of this forum and this event. And uh, yes, it is, um, it is a big honor to be talking about it, um, uh, especially about a, a topic that is very pressing in our times, uh, climate change and how we adapt to it and what real estate and the built environment uh, can contribute to this massive undertaking that is going to keep us busy for decades to come. Now, I've prepared a presentation which I would like to share with you. Um, so I hope you can all see my screen now. So sorry about the um, slight delay there. So I'm going to recap briefly on green building and market pricing and try to emphasize the UK perspective uh, on this on this topic. So starting with the good news, um, in terms of carbing and cutting our greenhouse gas emissions in general, uh, the UK, but also other Western countries um, have been quite successful, well, relatively speaking, um, and that we're at least moving in the right direction, as you can see from this graph. Uh, which shows the, the greenhouse gas emissions in, a, in the really long run. So going back to 1850. Now, the not so good news about this is um, if you look at where the, the emissions cuts actually come from mainly, and these are the, the little squiggly lines uh, underneath the, the large um, uh, blue area there. And they are mainly from phasing out coal emissions, um, coal-fired gas, um, coal-fired coal -fire plants, and so forth. Uh, they are less to do with the decarbonization of the built environment. So, if you were to plot a line of the of the emissions associated with the with the built environment, with buildings, uh, it would be nearly flat. Uh, and the reason for that is that in the UK, but also in other countries, we still have a big problem with our buildings in terms of the, the emissions they cause, the fabric of the building, the transition to net zero um, is going very, very slowly. And as we speak, we all know that there is a big conference, COP28, going on in Dubai where world leaders, scientists, uh, NGOs, others come together to tackle this problem uh, as it's becoming increasingly clear that the urgency of, of acting today, not tomorrow or the day after tomorrow, uh, is, is becoming, is staring us um, in the eyes. So um, what this also means is that the built environment which contributes up to 40% of greenhouse gas emissions needs to act fast. So what can be done about this? Um, well, first of all, I mentioned building fabric as one of the, one of the main pillars, the other one being um, uh, net zero carbon and low carbon technologies, uh, such as solar panels, um, heat pumps, and so forth. 
So starting with energy efficiency, the, the picture that we're facing today still is quite grim. Uh, and this is illustrated by this slide, which shows um, the energy performance ratings, which are mandatory in uh, most European countries and the distribution of them. So the share of dwellings with, you could say insufficient labels is uh, quite high and there is variation across countries, but there is simply too much orange and red in the distribution um, as it is shown here and not enough green, whether deep green or light green. So um, England, Wales is shown here uh, and it's kind of, it's not too bad uh, as um, in terms of the, the distribution, but it's also not outstanding either. The one thing that you notice about England and Wales is that it has virtually no dark green, no A-rated buildings um, in, the, in the building stock. And um, this has um, changed in maybe over the last one, two years, but there is still quite a, quite a small proportion. So that is something to watch out for as we go forward with our ambitions um, to go net zero in the UK and beyond. So what are some ways actually of, um, of looking at this? So energy efficiency is mainly about operational carbon. But one thing that I would like to address early on is embodied carbon. So the difference between embodied and operational carbon, which can be quite different uh, for different types of, of buildings. So there are more and more studies that show how embodied carbon, so the carbon that is um, contained in the building materials uh, that also um, that is also uh, emitted during the construction phase of the building and so forth. Um, so these things need to be considered along with the with the carbon emissions that uh, that we see in operation. And here is um, one of those studies that have uh, visualized the difference. So in these three um, blocks, you see residential and office buildings um, uh, shown in terms of an existing standard, a new standard, and the new advanced. And as you will expect, the existing has larger operational carbon emissions and the new, than the new standard, and the new advanced, again, in all three of those office buildings, residential buildings, and all buildings taken together is lower. Now, what you will also notice, though, is that the embodied carbon, at least in the sample that the authors looked here at, has actually gone up in some cases. Um, so for office buildings, it's uh, larger by a margin, um, uh, by a small margin, but in, um, in residential buildings, it's actually quite pronounced that the new advanced standard has lower operational carbon emissions, but um, higher embodied carbon due to different materials that are used, but also a, a, a variety of other channels. So this means that some of the operational gains in terms of um, going net zero are actually wiped out by um, additional embodied carbon. So that is something that I would just like to flag up in our discussion, and maybe we can come back to it in the panel discussion. The other problematic thing is that um, I showed you the um, the distribution across Europe in terms of the energy efficiency uh, ratings, but here you can see that the buildings actually perform, um, they don't always perform to what the label says, right? And this is shown by this graph. So you see for each of those uh, label grades, you see the actual consumption in terms of the energy intensity as it was measured in kilowatt hours per square meter per year. And it is becoming very clear that you find some really, really high consumption buildings uh, in each of those categories. So although on average, they might perform um, 
according to what the what the intrinsic evaluation would suggest. Uh, in practice, we have a wide range. So especially if you look at the A and B rated buildings, also C to a certain extent, we have some that are very high in actual consumption. And it is the actual consumption that matters for our climate rather than what it says on the label. So this is uh, indeed a concern uh, that we must address and uh, also to bring in line the, the, the label, the evaluation of energy performance certificates and what uh, the actual consumption say. So this brings me to approaches uh, of dealing with some of those challenges as I just outlined, outlined them briefly. So the first one would be a market-based approach. And this is something that most of my research has uh, revolved around in previous years. So suppose that um, we don't even need to regulate, which uh, a lot of economists would say is always the second best solution, but that markets would actually by and large take care um, of the problem via pricing mechanisms. So if the logic is then, if there is a price premium, uh, either in sale prices in the built environment or in, um, in rental rates or also other indicators such as vacancy rates, uh, the time it takes to lease uh, a building and so forth. Uh, if the market rewards um, green behavior, so to speak, and efforts uh, towards going net zero, then um, maybe the regulations wouldn't be needed or they wouldn't be needed to the extent um, that some th that you would expect. So here are two, uh, two examples of green value or green premium, as we've observed it. And I've done many, many studies as uh, have some of the esteemed colleagues that are here today, uh, Professor Shimizu, for example, who I've worked with and who's also done a lot of work in this area, among others. So, um, on the left-hand side, you can see uh, a depiction of the residential green premium in the UK as we've measured it a while ago, which shows clearly that compared to the least efficient buildings, uh, we see price premium of those uh, most efficient buildings in the range of uh, six to even 14% for the highest uh, grade. So this is for the, for the residential market, the housing market in England and Wales, on the right hand side, you can see a similar pattern, although um, the, the graph looks different and it is not for entire countries, but it is for the London office market and the Paris office market. And this is by a recent release by MCI, um, which measures the, the price difference between sales prices with and without a green building certification, such as Brium, LEED, um, a couple of others. And as you can see, it's quite astonishing how this price premium has evolved just over the last um, six or seven years in those countries uh, or those markets, London and Paris. So especially during and after the pandemic, we see a notable increase in this green price premium in, in offices. Now, it is fascinating to speculate about this and what, um, what the underlying causes are, I think one of them is that, and we can discuss this later, maybe also in the panel discussion, um, that um, it has become increasingly challenging for office buildings um, to differentiate themselves. And one way to differentiate themselves is by offering tenants, offering occupants um, a better environment, better uh, indoor air quality, better lighting, just a, a better indoor environment in general. And green buildings um, come with that promise, uh, which they usually fulfill with, with a few exceptions, obviously. But in general, you could say that the green label is almost a proxy for a better building. And having a better building commands a premium, especially in this challenging environment that the office market currently faces. And, is going to face for the foreseeable future with developments like working from home um, and others. So 
Um, another challenge here is um, the concept of office buildings, but also other commercial buildings or even residential buildings. Any kind of real estate investment today needs to think carefully about the risk of becoming a stranded asset. Now, I know the term stranded asset is quite a controversial one because it um, originates more from the, um, from the energy sector where you think about uh, things like coal-fired coal power plants as stranded assets. So if your country decides to phase out those fossil fuel-based um, energy generating plants, then those, um, those power plants become obsolete and become stranded. It's slightly different in the real estate sector and the built environment because you could always argue no building should ever get stranded. It can always be um, refurbished. It can always be upgraded to a standard. The question is, is it um, economically viable and feasible to do so? And that's where the stranding might come in. Uh, it, it might not be stranded in terms of it is completely impossible to upgrade a building. I think any building can be upgraded to a standard. But in a lot of cases, um, the amount of capital investment that will be required um, is just um, out, of, uh, out of proportion with, uh, the, with the economic payoff. So here is um, a graph that, um, the, uh, that CREM put together. CREM, um, for those of you who don't know, is uh, an organization um, uh, glo that globally defines uh, decarbonization pathways and have gone a long way towards specifying what this would look like um, in, uh, in terms of aligning a portfolio for a company with the 1.5 um, degree warming scenario of Paris. So the way they it's envisaged here is that you have for each building, you have an emission intensity line and then once that line drops um, drops off, so the building becomes larger. Uh, sorry, the the um, the emissions are no longer in line with what's required. You have stranding points, and those stranding points need to be um, addressed, and they they can be addressed by retrofits. And typically, over the last over the next um, well thirty years, you will need more than one retrofit. So to uh, align your portfolio with the with the uh, net zero target uh, and the 1.5 degree target, you will need, um, uh, in this case, two retrofits of the building. And this is um, kind of a general stylized graph, but this can also be specified for each building separately. And you can put very concrete uh, numbers against uh, these decarbonization targets. But the idea here is um, to act proactively and early to prevent stranding of assets. So, okay, so now that we've established that, the question is obviously, how do you address this? What is the best strategy? What is the best mix? What is the best package uh, that you can use for, um, for going net zero and, and uh, making sure that you stay on the path uh, of decarbonization. Well, one thing to keep in mind that is very powerful is that a kilowatt hour save is almost always cheaper than a kilowatt hour generated by whatever means. So this is shown in this graph, which shows the range of levelized costs uh, in cents per kilowatt hours. This is from an American publication, but it's more or less the same in all countries. So energy efficiency measures are typically cheaper and give more bang for the buck, as they say, um, in terms of saving energy and saving carbon emissions. So any yen, dollar, pound we invest in energy efficiency measures usually has a bigger payoff than investing in in other technologies, including things like wind and solar. Now, this is a very sweeping statement obviously and doesn't always apply but it is um, it is true in a lot of cases so this brings us to a strategy or suggests a strategy 
of what's been termed fabric fast. So if we have a limited amount of resources, which as economists, we always assume, um, where should we put a given amount of money? Fabric first is one strategy in the residential, but also in the commercial sector. I should say, first of all, we address the, the leaky windows, uh, the thermal bridges, the, the problems with a, a building's uh, fabric, whether it's a detached family home, whether it's a large uh, CBD office tower with 60 stories in the center of Tokyo, um, we should always address fabric first. Um, now that's um, a widely accepted strategy. Uh, another one that is diametrically opposed to that would be building electrification. So the logic of building electrification goes like this. It says, as we know, fabric upgrades are um, very um, complicated. They have very complex undertakings. They are very disruptive. Um, in a lot of cases, occupants, tenants uh, will move, have to move out. Um, there's going to be a long phase uh, of uh, an income producing asset when it won't be producing any um, uh, cash flow and so forth. So the fabric, the fabric fast strategy has the, the downside that it is really disruptive. So what if we just don't go, um, uh, what if we just go ahead and try to electrify our buildings as much as possible and then worry about the fabric upgrades, the building upgrades later on? Because the electrification is a lot faster than dealing with um, facades, with, um, with uh, roof insulations and so forth. Um, you can... It's a lot easier to put on solar panels or install uh, heat pumps and so forth, um, install batteries. So these are two diametrically opposed um, strategies. So which one should we go with? Well, um, there is no clear cut answer and I'm not here to tell you one is the better one than the other. But one thing that we do need to keep in mind in terms of um, the electrification scenario is that obviously if we don't upgrade the if we don't prioritize the the building and the and the fabric upgrades then we'll be facing a lot more energy demand because we haven't upgraded our buildings and that especially during peak hours is going to create big big problems for our electricity grid and here is um, a graph from one publication that shows in relatively drastic terms, what this will mean um, over the course of the year. Uh, and this is for the US, where especially in winter months, you'll have skyrocketing electricity demand measured in terawatt hours, uh, if you go with electrification scenarios. They differentiated by a uh, different uh, coefficient of performance, so that's the COP, uh, and I also break it down by sectors. But as you can see, um, some of the scenarios have really, really large um, demand implications. So uh, it is questionable whether this electrification first and then maybe worry about buildings later uh, is even doable from an energy demand and grid load perspective. So this brings us to the, the question of risks and the inherent risks uh, that we're facing um, if we don't do enough or we're too slow off the mark in terms of addressing the, um, these challenges. And here is um, a, an overview of the multiple levels of risks that we're facing in the built environment. So both in terms of the general public, but also in terms of uh, real estate investors. And it's really, important that we understand all the dis different levels of risks. So the blue squares on the left hand side show general risks that are might be understood by now but not, are not easily quantifiable. So things like physical risk of, uh, of damage from climate change for example, regulatory risk, um, there might or might not be 
um, uh, additional regulations. Some of you will know the, the change in regulations that the current UK government has announced, where it has downgraded the, um, the ambition in terms of um, minimum uh, efficiency standards, which I'm also going to talk about in the next session. So regulatory risk can go both ways. There can be regulations that are uh, um, that are coming at investors and buildings uh, at a at relatively short notice, but also when there is a change in policy or a change in government, there can also be um, a, a loosening of the of the regulations. And uh, for those that have already invested in the technology and have anticipated more stringent regulations, um, that is definitely not welcome news. So um, market risks, technology risks, multiple risks that are very hard to quantify, and yet we need to quantify them um, to base our sound and solid business decisions on them. So that's why as we move towards the green squares here, uh, we can do a better job of quantifying them. So we have energy price um, projections. They might have to go out of the window because um, of unforeseen events, but generally we can uh, we can develop scenarios. Same with valuation, interest rates, uh, rental effects, house price dynamics, occupancy levels. Um, there we can at least make an effort to put numbers on these things. Whether they act, how accurate they are, is um, is a different question. But at least we make some headway towards quantifying these uh, rather fuzzy risks that are shown in blue here. So just to give you one example that I was involved in, um, at the EU level, uh, there was um, a project that um, quantified that, well, one of the things we did was develop a tool which would allow any, um, any uh, building owner or investor in, uh, with a portfolio of buildings would allow them to calculate the payback um, of refurbishments of rental housing using relatively detailed information. But for those that don't, wouldn't have the, the detailed information, they, um, they would still be able to work with kind of default assumptions. So it, this tool was very flexible and is still very flexible and is in use and you can, um, uh, it's freely available and accessible. So if you like, you could go to the website of this project called RentalCal and uh, look at the tool, look at the outputs that we've generated. So I think this was a valuable contribution towards um, getting the, the retrofit challenge underway and reducing the uncertainty and the risks that I just mentioned in the previous slide. So this brings me on to um, possible regulatory approaches. So whereas in the, in the previous section, I talked about market-based solutions, uh, mainly around energy savings, which then um, also affect the bottom line uh, of uh, any company, but also for households, uh, and also based on more transparency to mitigate risks and to navigate this journey to net zero. Um, we also need to talk about regulatory approaches. Because in the past, a lot of what worked in markets was framed somehow by regulations. So what I mean by that is, um, in the current debate about whether companies, real estate companies or otherwise should go zero, one of the biggest reasons for doing so, even without being required to do so by hard regulations is the anticipation of future regulation, which is typically um, quite a big incentive for companies to act. So even if the regulations aren't in place yet, they might come into force at some point. And then some companies will get caught out and will get stranded, uh, either in literal sense or a metaphorical sense. Um, and to anticipate that and be proactive, um, companies need to act. So the two things, markets and regulations, 
they work in tandem usually. They are not isolated from each other. Uh, and even future regulations can be an incentive um, for markets to internalize externalities. So I would like to show you some of my research on, um, on one of those policies, regulatory policies in the built environment, which is the, the minimum energy efficiency standard called MIS. So without going into details of um, how the process works, here is just a, a flow chart that uh, demonstrates the, uh, the process. Um, but by and large, it means that um, the UK government has decided that there is a, there must be a floor in terms of the, the energy efficiency that is required um, or the energy efficiency level which uh, a, a building must perform to. So there is a minimum standard. If you're not performing um, according to this minimum standard, which is defined as a label of at least E or above, um, then a landlord may not let out the property. Um, so uh, they lose their income stream, they cannot rent the property. Uh, and that applies to both the, the residential sector and the office uh, and the commercial sector. So you would think that um, those mi minimum energy efficiency standards would be common sense, but there are also obviously some buildings that cannot fulfill the requirements there, and there are some exemptions uh, that landlords can apply for, uh, both the regulations are slightly different for residential and commercial, but generally, if a landlord can demonstrate that they will um, have to uh, make very, very large uh, capital investments, uh, they may be exempt. And this is sometimes the case for uh, old buildings, historic buildings, uh, that are hard to treat in terms of upgrading um, and their exemptions. Not too many have actually been granted, but um, there is this, this possibility. But for the bulk of the market, this means that um, some, some of these um, buildings in the F and G, the lowest energy efficiency grade, really face being stranded, as I showed before. So, there is also, obviously, apart from the, the environmental dimension, there is also a socioeconomic or social dimension of these min minimum energy efficiency standards. Uh, remember the graph I showed you before with low um, orange and red colored um, uh, EPC bands. Um, you could also look at who actually lives in these buildings, who occupies these buildings, and it's maybe to a certain extent also the case in commercial buildings. But there is this concept of fuel poverty. So um, fuel poverty meaning that some households need to spend an extraordinary amount um, and proportion uh, of their low incomes on energy. And this is uh, always the case, especially during winter months. Um, and as you can see, the fuel core uh, disproportionately um, are in the, in the lowest categories. So this table above shows for each EPC ban um, who actually lives, uh, inhabits these buildings. And for the, the most energy efficient ones, it's the highest um, income brackets. And for the lowest ones, um, there, uh, there is a, a larger uh, proportion of fuel pool. So if those F and G buildings also cause higher energy bills, then it's those who can least afford it who are most exposed to it. Uh, and it's the same um, pretty much in other countries as well. At the bottom, you can see that um, Another problem that is maybe specific to the UK market is that portfolio sizes in the, in the residential investment market, the private rental sector, is um, it's very fragmented. So you have a lot of um, landlords and building owners that only own one, two, three, four assets, um, but not more than that. So if you compare 2010 and 2018, you can see that, well, not too much has changed, but at least the, 
the proportion of landlords that only own one building and aren't really professional landlords uh, has gone down. And I, I would argue that it is, um, it would be a lot more efficient uh, to get to net zero if we have more institutional investors who can do this at a large scale rather than having a fragmented market, uh, especially in the residential sector with millions of small scale investors. So here is just a, um, an example of the timeline um, of MIS and um, slightly different regulations I said for the residential and commercial market, but it just shows how long it takes from one of the first idea of uh, implement of, of devising a policy and actually implementing it and and uh, also enforcing it. So the um, this MIS policy goes back to um, well, 2010. And then when it was announced in, in 2011, um, there was also an energy as part of the Energy Act uh, that was published. Then it took, um, well, the better part of a decade or almost a decade uh, to actually come into effect on the 1st of April in 2018. And then there were several phases where it was rolled out to existing leases and the latest development should have been that it's not just the F and G grade, but uh, anything up to C uh, grade that um, the standard would be lifted. But um, as I said, the UK government has um, decided not to go ahead with it for now. So what are possible reactions to this from a landlord perspective? So essentially um, you can have four. So the first option would be to just upgrade the same building and continue leasing as normal. The second one would be to sell off this rental building into the owner occupier market uh, because the owner occupier market is not affected by the regulation yet it only affects rental buildings. So that's always an option. Um, obviously, since I mentioned anticipation, there is always the threat of the owner occupier market at some point also being covered uh, by these minimum standards, um, which is something that is already under debate in the UK. Uh, when it's going to happen uh, is anyone's guess, but um, that's that's a definite possibility. Then you, option three would be to upgrade and then sell into either the rental market or the owner occupier market. And the fourth option would be, as I mentioned, to apply for an exemption where that's possible. So these are kind of the four um, the four options that landlords face. So what have they done? Um, and this is uh, a a um, illustration of our results from a paper um, that is currently under review and uh, will also be first published as a um, as a government um, report, which shows that rental prices for the F and G, so the affected buildings, experience a significant decrease in phase four. So what we've done here is we've traced the, um, the rental prices of F and G rated and all other buildings over the, over the whole period. So uh, starting from, well, we've got data going back to 2010 to match the actual time horizon of the policy when it was first announced. And then we have the four different phases that I just showed you. And as you can see, if you were in the treatment group and treatment group here means the F and G, the lowest energy efficiency ratings that were faced with, uh, that were faced with, um, with being stranded more or less, um, you can see that they, they uh, experienced a discount of about 3.2%. And the graph on the right-hand side shows that um, the F and G really dropped off uh, compared to the um, to the higher bounds, the A and G, in terms of the of the rents. Now we've done a similar study, and that was just accepted for publication in um, the Journal Energy Policy, um, where we've looked at uh, the office rental market, and again, and we find an even stronger result there, where we have. Um, in the announcement phase, we have uh, uh, the market anticipating um, 
tough times for the FNG rated buildings. And there we find a discount of 5.8%. And then again, in the enactment phase, an additional discount to those buildings, the FNG buildings of 2.7%. So quite a strong discount um, that we that we see um, from the policy. And I think this is a good illustration of what I meant by markets and regulations working in tandem. So I doubt that we would have seen similar um, discounts if it wasn't the threat of the regulation underpinning these market discounts. I'm sure there would have been, and we've also measured this uh, in countries and markets that don't have the, the, the regulation that requires this, we see generally that buildings that are of a better energy efficiency standard also um, command higher rents and prices. But uh, what we're able to demonstrate here is an additional effect of the policy and the regulation um, in terms of rents and prices that are achieved and achievable here. Uh, and this is just another illustration of the same paper on the office market that is about to uh, come out in uh, energy policy shortly, which shows that um, the, um, the, the number of FNG buildings has also dropped off. So on the left-hand side, you can see the, the percentage of uh, EPC grades. And the market has responded not just in terms of discounting uh, the prices, but also in terms of um, upgrading buildings and fewer and fewer of, um, of the buildings are FNG rated. And they're in fact being phased out as you would expect. So um, just to finish um, off um, because um, being mindful of time. Um, so where do we go from here? Um, one aspect that is important is that, as I said before, in a market that is characterized by a large fragmentation uh, of building owners, it will be very hard to make a big uh, inroads into going net zero. So we need to scale up our efforts and we need to scale them up quickly. And this applies to residential and commercial markets alike. Um, retrofits simply are the most effective if they are done at the portfolio or net neighborhood level. So not just going building by building, um, but having a larger structure in place, a coordinated um, neighborhood or portfolio-wide strategy. Um, that's the optimal way to go. And yet a lot of the policies um, do not take this into account. There are some efforts, um, but they are few and far between uh, to actually achieve scale in all this. So I think our our efforts for the next few years in, um, in this transformation towards net zero buildings and decarbonization of our stock um, needs to focus on scale. And we need to get into a situation where we um, allow the flexibility of exemptions, but they need to be an opt out rather than an opt in basis. So the standard should be um, the upgrading, the energy efficiency, rather than uh, opting in as it is at the moment. Um, so just to wrap up um, the few lessons that I've learned from, um, from doing uh, research uh, in the built environment and both residential and uh, office markets, um, it is now abundantly clear that we need to decarbonize the building stock and the building sector rapidly to meet um, the global commitment to being uh, net zero by 2050, but also to meet the more shorter term uh, targets uh, set for 2030. Um, the good news is that most studies and reports conclude that the current efforts um, have gone some way, uh, but not so much in the, in the uh, in the built environment and the commercial and, uh, and the residential real estate sector are lagging woefully behind other efforts that are much, much quicker, uh, even including transport uh, and the transition to um, low and zero uh, uh, carbon emission transportation. So there is an urgent need to act and act at scale, but there is a, uh, overwhelming evidence 
that climate risk and energy efficiency are priced in real estate to a certain extent, at least um, worldwide. And yeah, I've contributed um, to some of those studies and was privileged to work with uh, my esteemed colleagues on these studies. And as we've also seen, there is also a dynamic that these price effects are likely to become more and more pronounced uh, as both the, the decarbonization action and the physical effects of climate change accelerate. Most existing buildings, um, this has been demonstrated, can be saved from becoming stranded assets. But um, especially when you factor in a life cycle um, perspective and embodied carbon, but it, it shouldn't be a given, be taken as a given that all buildings will actually be able to, to make the, um, to, to receive the upgrades that are necessary. UK policy so far in the built environment has focused on defining and enforcing those minimum efficiency standards, but it has also demonstrated how difficult it is to get everyone on board um, to, uh, to get to these minimum standards. But I think, Overall, those minimum standards are the way to go. Um, we, we will always have state-of-the-art, top green buildings, um, net zero, uh, or even um, negative in terms of uh, emissions or generating more energy than they use. Uh, there are some fantastic examples there in Japan, all over the world, um, that demonstrate what's possible even today. Um, in terms of uh, defining buildings of the future. But first and foremost, we need to look after the worst of the worst in terms of energy efficiency, making sure that they get upgraded because that is the, the low hanging fruit that we can reap. And those is, that's also where most of the unnecessary um, carbon emissions take place. So if we look at the policy and it's early days and maybe too early to evaluate what the, uh, what the MIS policy has really achieved, but the first signs are that um, the policy has been successful in reducing the prevalence of substandard properties in the rental market for both residential and office markets. And although the UK government has uh, halted the efforts to uh, roll out the policy and make it more stringent for now, um, it is only a matter of time, if I could hazard a guess, um, uh, it will only uh, it won't take too long until further mark both market-based and regulatory interventions uh, are to be expected. Um, so that is all um, I would like to talk about today uh, in my presentation. Again, thank you very much um, for listening and I look forward to the, um, to the following discussions. Thank you very much. フランス増やせ先生、誠にありがとうございました。